Welcome back to part three, critical thinking, analysis and materials to combat climate change. We consider the effect of China on the markets, as well as the issue of intermittency, while considering alternative storage, materials, wind, solar, and redox batteries. If you want to build reliable electricity in China, yes, they, they can add substantial amounts more wind and solar, and they're doing that. But what they should be doing is building five times the number of nuclear reactors that they're building. Yes. Then you ask the question, well, why aren't they? Well, because there are very few supplies of uranium in China. And if you haven't noticed, the West is not being particularly polite to China these days. We can argue about whether this is you know, deserved or undeserved, doesn't yeah. really matter. The point is they're not going to add nuclear reactors that depend on uranium being produced in Canada or in Kazakhstan or somewhere else if they're not certain that they can get it because they would shut their society down yeah. if that uranium can't be obtained. So then the next obvious question is, okay, if we see shutting those carbon fired or those carbon emitting coal fired plants down in China as a valuable thing to do, how can we as a little country like Canada do something to help the Chinese feel confident in their uranium supply so that they would build those reactors and shut those coal-fired plants down. China is not against doing this, right? They're on a program to do it now, and they'd love to take those emissions out of the air to give their own citizens more a more breathable atmosphere. But it's not a viable option today because they can't be sure they're, they're not going to run out of uranium fuel. And maybe you can speak to, because I don't like when people get a little disillusioned, they think, okay, this intermittency issue, oh, then just, yep. we just forget it then. <laughs> uh, is that, yeah, there's an intermittency issue, but there's also technology being, uh, and we won't go too in depth into it. I'd love to do a show separately on it, but sure. when you look at a, a specific uh, material metal that, that you really like, which is vanadium and vanadium redox right. batteries, there's things being developed and currently used, they're not like uh, dream world stuff, no, that can no. solve this intermittency issue. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, lithium batteries. Yes, we can we can use lithium batteries to store electricity. The, the, the value of a lithium battery, though, is more in this sort of a device, you know, a, a cell phone. It's, it's the portability and the energy density that that lithium provides. That's where the real value is putting a million batteries in a building that is admittedly very tough to pick up and move doesn't seem like a great use of lithium. So then you start to think about other technologies that can store electricity. And you come into things like you mentioned, Andrew, the, the vanadium oxidation re reduction batteries, redox cells that are out there. Um, big tanks of liquid that get pumped through you know, through, uh, through cells that contain the right catalysts and the right elements to effectively take that electricity and turn it back into something that can be utilized to do work. The problem there is how much vanadium is in the world? What's the price of vanadium going to move to as we try to do this? We already have lithium, for example, at near historic highs, about $80,000 a ton of lithium chemical prices that we've never seen before, prices that are already impacting the, the, the utility and the usability of lithium in things like electric vehicles. So we have to worry about prices of critical materials, but there are even alternatives there. For example, we, we know the Canadians are pretty good at mining, right? I mean, we've, we've done a fair bit of this. There are companies out there who are taking Canadian mining technology and using it to do things like go onto the site of a disused coal plant somewhere. You've got power lines running in. You've got excess capacity on those lines because the coal plant isn't producing any electricity anymore. And they will use remote mining technology to excavate a cavity underground that they then pump air into during the evening and the night when electricity is cheap. And they allow that air to flood out again through turbines to reconstitute electricity during the day when electricity is required. 
that sort of compressed air energy storage is proven. It is absolutely in use in the market today. We know its cost and it's tractable. It's much more attractive than using lithium batteries. But the, the drawback to compressed air energy storage used to be, I need to find a cavity that's already there. Yes. Yeah. Close to power lines close to you know the, the 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 demand for it and on and on and on and the number of abandoned salt mines that happen to be close to a city near a power line <laughs> yeah is not that great yes now you know these canadian companies with the use of canadian remote mining technology are making it possible to dig a cavity underground and put this just about anywhere and by the way we're not talking about an enormous cavity if you're talking about megawatt levels of power even up to 100 megawatts and you're talking about hours of duration for this storage system you're talking about something that has the volume of a you know a decent sized underground parking garage no more than that now does this require uh the salt type cavern so it is like a, no, a specific no, no it doesn't it's, no it's 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 any it's any competent body of rock that they can access whether it's you know, you, you don't want it to be three kilometers underground or anything no, like yeah, that. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. you, you know, if it's if it's two or three hundred meters down, you sink a shaft to it, you dig the, you dig out the cavity and you add the additional equipment to basically make this work. And that equipment is understood. It exists. It's used in industry already. It's used in the power grid itself. You're just making an artificial cavity to make it go. Yes, now, it adds this capital cost, but but not a huge amount. How does this uh, differ from, say, a geothermal specifically? Well, if you're doing geothermal, what you're doing is you're is you're essentially digging um, a line down to a hot, hot mantle bed. at some point. Yes, you're looking for a, you're looking for a hot rock. Yeah, and hot enough to basically boil water. Um, that's going to be fairly deep. I mean, I, I at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, I was working 6,800 feet underground. Oh. The rock face, new rock face was warm. You know, it was probably about 38 or 40 degrees Celsius. But it ain't going to boil water. So you're talking about going far, far deeper than that. With okay. these sorts of storage projects, you're not talking about digging down, you know, anything close, you know, to a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, two kilometers underground. You don't need to. And that, and that obviously limits the cost yes. of doing this for the yes. most part. It makes it tractable. So that's that's very interesting because once again, like when I I haven't spent a lot of time with geothermal, but it also just seems like it's another tool that if you have the oh, geology, you have the geology, you have the the right system. Yes, uh, if you're Iceland, use it. We can we can yes, do it. Please. Um, but if you try to apply it, say in uh, BC, it's you know like listen, it's it's not the right fit. We have to find yeah, and the I, right and, fit and, and, the I, right and I'd add, Andrew, it's reliable. That's the other part that's yes. important. Geothermal yes. is baseload. Yes, it's reliable yes. enough to be depended on. And by the way, for people who don't understand um, that terminology in the grid, baseload reliable, quote unquote, electricity doesn't mean it's 100 percent reliable. Everything breaks. I mean, even the nuclear industry, I don't want to I don't want to raise the specter of, you know, of, of actual reactor failures because those never really happen. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in any real sense, unless some design flaw has been incorporated like say building a reactor near an earthquake zone you yeah. know on a coast yeah um not a great idea yeah. but if you're talking about nuclear even nuclear energy is about 92 93 percent reliable um you know turbines break you know power electronics fails you know switches go out i mean this happens so if anything is sort of 80 percent 75 to 80 percent plus reliable we call it base load yeah now if we go to if we go and look at wind and solar for example in the last year or two you know and the u.s department of energy publishes these figures you can go look um up sets of data on things like capacity factors for these different generating assets and these are not cherry picked numbers these are just what occurs in the united states wind if memory serves is only about 25 percent reliable and wind is only about 35 percent reliable and the numbers make sense i mean the wind doesn't blow all the time or it blows too fast sometimes yeah. and the sun doesn't shine at night the last time i checked so you know you're starting from a base of about 50 percent for solar photovoltaic 
you don't have a choice. That's not good enough to run, you know, our modern society. We expect the lights to go on when we flip the switch and we need base load electricity. That means in addition to the solar and the wind, which are absolutely going to play roles, we're going to need some base load. That includes geothermal, that includes hydroelectricity, that includes nuclear.